God can restore, He can bring a greater quality of life. That's what abundant life means. Abundant life means a quality of life that is superfluous, superabundant, outstanding in its measure. We must do something in a part. It's called a faith and a trust through which God will begin to bring this breakthrough in our hearts. From within, as you praise God, you will begin to see these chains broken from the inside. I want to thank you for stopping by to watch this YouTube sermon. I believe your life will be deeply impacted by the truths that are in this message. Remember, the Word of God is like seed which God gives to us. Seed from heaven which brings God's life, power and wisdom. And as you receive these truths into your heart, it has the power to transform your life completely. Can you also do a favor for us? Can you please like this video and send the link to a friend whom you know will be blessed through this? And if you are not a subscriber yet, would you please subscribe to this channel so that we can reach more people? God bless you as you watch this message. The Lord spoke to my heart about how so many are coming to the church but not experiencing the breakthrough of God in their life because they have allowed strongholds to develop in their heart strongholds that have been developed from their upbringing, their culture, from their life background. And they've allowed it to cause their heart to be influenced negatively by God. And that stronghold is not necessarily in the area of sin, like drinking or drug addiction or sexual sins or immorality. But the stronghold is in the area of the state of the heart that is not causing them to engage with God by faith and with that genuine and fervent heart so that they are not able to receive the word. They are not able to act on the word. So that even though they come to church, even though they hear the sermon, and even though they pray and they worship, yet in their heart there is this connection that is not happening in the word, in, in the relationship with God and that is causing their heart not to experience the kingdom of God. And let me give you certain states of the heart that the Lord highlighted to me. Number one is the wounded heart. The wounded heart. A heart that has been affected by all the hurtful and negative words that have been spoken into you, even through relationships, through your parents. Second is the broken heart. The broken heart is the heart that has lost trust because of things you have experienced. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe you have experienced injustice. Maybe someone has been unfaithful to you. So that's a heart that is broken. And unless you allow God to bring healing into that heart, the enemy can use that brokenness to influence your life wrongly. So that even though you may not be out there doing things that are outright sin, yet because that heart is broken, you're unable to, to connect with God. Unable to practice the Word of God. The third is this, the hardened heart. The hardened heart is when you refuse to allow the truth to impact your heart. Paul spoke about the people at Rome, how even though they're hearing the truth of the gospel, they choose not to believe. They choose not to acknowledge God as Lord, as Creator, and they've hardened their heart. And I sense that many even come to our church, and even though they hear the Word of God, they do not submit to it. They're not willing to believe in it. And they rely more on their own reasoning and in their own thoughts, in their own beliefs. So that's a hardened heart. The fourth is this. And I believe a lot of us are carrying this in your heart. So please take notice of this. The weary heart. Everyone say the weary heart. It's a heart that has been tired and weary because of the prolonged issues you have been facing in your life. The problem that you have been praying for but that has not been removed and is still lingering in your life. The family issues, the constant strife in the family for years and the Lord hasn't brought the transformation. The people have not transformed. So that weariness in your heart causes you to want to give up. The struggle in your heart, in your personal life, your habits, it keeps on lingering and your heart becomes weary and you're wondering, Lord, how long? How long, how long do I continue to struggle in this? The fifth one is this, very important. And I sense that many in Nagaland, we carry this sadness and melancholy. It's a huge stronghold. In fact, it is embedded into our ancient culture where most of our songs are about sadness, about leaving, about loss, 
about sorrow. So sadness and melancholy is a feeling of constant dejection, a low spirit of depression and discouragement. And I believe that many are addicted to that feeling of sadness. And when people are happy, you're wondering why they're happy and you're even offended that people are happy and rejoicing. And when you talk, especially among your family or among close ones around the fire, most of the talk is about sad things. And all the talk is about sadness, that melancholy, which we think is natural and we think is the normal state of our being. It is not. Because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The normal state of our heart as a believer, as a child of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, with Jesus living in our lives, the normal state of our life is peace and joy and a sense of rightness with God all the time because heaven is in our heart. We may not be in heaven, but if you're born again, heaven is in our heart. And let me tell you this, there is no sadness in heaven. There's no tears in heaven. There is no melancholy in heaven. We see pictures of angels floating on clouds and playing on harps, but that's not the picture of heaven. That's an artist's impression. So what is melancholy? Melancholy, it refers to a heart of a person's, his emotional state that is characterized by a deep sadness, sorrow, a feeling of pensive sadness, a sense of longing, nostalgia, a general feeling of being downcast or gloomy. That is huge in Nagaland. See, because we carry sadness of our own condition and our circumstances. We are sad because we are not like America or Korea. Our roads are terrible. Our leaders, we keep on hearing negativity. Wherever you go, there's negativity. So you keep on hearing about that all the time. Your heart gets weary. You hear about corruption all the time, everywhere. You don't hear good news about development that's happening positively in Nagaland. And all of those news, it causes your heart to carry the sadness, the melancholy. So when you come to the Word of God and the Word of God encouraging us to praise the Lord, the Word of God encouraging us to believe in the Lord, the Word of God encouraging us, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. In the church, when you're in the service, you can believe. But the moment you step out of the halls of the church, again, you're faced with that heaviness and you're unable to overcome that cloud, this sorrow, this blanket of sorrow and melancholy and weariness in the heart so that we are not able to go and practice the Word and live by faith wherever we are from Monday to Saturday. And this is the area where God wants to touch. That many of us may be carrying a broken heart, a weary heart, a hardened heart, a sad heart, and not realizing, because we are not out there sinning, we may be thinking we are all right, but not realizing that that state of the heart is not allowing you to experience the fullness of God's grace upon your life. As the book of Proverbs says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of your heart flow the issues of life. So if your heart is always filled with sadness, sadness because of your past mistakes, and you're carrying that sadness all the time, you are not going to be able to experience the flow of God's purpose and life and His blessings that He still wants to bring in your life. Maybe you are 60 years old. Your life is not over yet. The rest of your life is still ahead of you. But if you're going to carry that sadness and that brokenness, it is going to hinder you. It's going to be a stumbling block. Because your life will flow out of your heart. And your heart must connect to the Word. Because the Word brings God's truth to our lives. So when you connect your heart to the Word, you're connecting to God. And that is the way God will bring forth out of your life. With all your sorrow, with all your sadness, with all your mess, He can still bring something beautiful out of your life. But He needs you to believe in Him. He needs you to trust in Him. And He needs you to be willing to acknowledge today with all humility, I carry a sad heart. I carry a melancholy heart. I carry a heart of regret. I'm always regretting the things of the past. I'm only carrying sadness all my life. And understand that that is the real thing that is hindering you. It's not God. It's not people. It's not Nagaland. It's not our leaders. Your own heart is hindering you from your future coming to pass in your life. You cannot change the past, it's gone. You cannot change the decisions of your parents that may be the reason why you're at loss today. But the only place that you are responsible for which even God will not come and infringe on your right is your heart. That's the only place you are responsible for. And that's the place you can decide today, I'm going to change. That's the place you can decide today to take responsibility over and come out of that stronghold and begin to live a life of faith. And the key that God gave me is this, praise and thanksgiving. So turn to Psalms 100. 
And I really want to stress that each and every one of us must practice this. I sense in my heart strong sorrow in many people's hearts today because of loss. We all go through loss in this life. But loss is not bigger than God. Loss is not bigger than your destiny and your future. But if you allow it, the loss you have experienced can steal your destiny. Whatever you have lost, God can add into your life. I'm not saying God will give you a new father again, no. But God can add into your heart so that you will experience the heavenly father in a greater capacity and enjoy his love more than the love of your earthly father you lost. Your husband may have divorced you or let you go, but you can experience Jesus as your husband in a greater, dearer, more intimate manner in a better way than your husband was to you. So God can restore, He can bring a greater quality of life. That's what abundant life means. Abundant life means a quality of life that is superfluous, super abundant, outstanding in its measure. That's what Jesus says, I have come that you may have life, not sadness, not melancholy. Always walking around with a sad heart. You're not being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He's not the spirit of sadness. He's not the spirit of sorrow. <laughs> The Holy Spirit is not a spirit of sorrow. He's a spirit of joy. Can everyone say joy? We must do something in a part. It's called a faith and a trust through which God will begin to bring this breakthrough in our hearts. From within, as you praise God, you will begin to see these chains broken from the inside. Psalms 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. God is not going to shout. We have to shout. We have to make a joyful noise to the Lord with our praise. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. So singing is an important part. Don't lose your song no matter how much you have gone through in your life. Many times faith is expressed in our songs. Your trust is expressed in your song. I'm not talking about just hymns and Christian songs we sing in church. I'm talking about the song of your heart, the rhythm of peace and joy in your heart. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. We are His people. Don't just see yourself as Nagas, tiny when it comes to the assembly of the nations in the world. No. We are His people. God is our Lord. We may be tiny in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God, we are big. Hallelujah. Live with the joy that God is my God. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Enter into His courts with praise. What do we mean by gates? Gates is a place of strength. Gate is a place of entrance. Gate is a place of authority in scriptures. So we enter into strength. We enter into authority. Christ's authority into our lives through our praise and our thanksgiving. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. Well, the next verse tells us, verse 5, For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and the truth endures to all generations. Hallelujah. So why do we praise God? We praise God simply because of who He is. It has nothing to do with our circumstance. It has nothing to do with what is happening in our lives. We praise God for who He is. What is that? His character. His attribute. He is good. He's always good. Our lives may not be good at the moment. We may be going through sorrow and difficulty and darkness. But God is good. He's always good. Yes. Hallelujah. So if we are looking below the clouds, if our perspective of life is below the clouds, we're always seeing our natural circumstances. We are seeing the news of war in Ukraine, in Russia, in Israel. We are seeing inflation rise at the prices of goods, floods everywhere. So we are seeing all of those negative news and our eyesight is always looking at negativity and our heart begins to be pulled down. But when we look above the clouds, when we look above the skies and we look to the Lord, we see His character, we see His nature. He's always good. He's always faithful. So we praise God for who He is. That means we have to intentionally look away from ourselves, from our circumstance and look to Him and respond to Him. Don't respond to your circumstance. Don't respond to the negativity in your life. Respond to God from your heart and begin to praise Him and bless Him for who He is. He never changes. He's always a good God. Do you know that when Israel was faced with attack from the enemies, 
they always overcame by looking to God, not looking to the enemies, by looking to God and singing, God is good and His mercy endures forever. God is good and His mercy endures forever. Can you imagine how foolish that looks? That when enemies are attacking you, you are looking away from your enemies and you're looking to God and saying, God, you are good, your mercy endures forever and God fights for them. Because we are trained to look at the problems every day. And when we look at the problems every day, our problems become bigger and bigger in our perspective. We thank God for what He has done and what He is doing in our lives. And when we thank Him, we are blessing Him. The Bible says, bless Him through our thanksgiving. Can you say Amen? Hallelujah. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In every situation and circumstance of life, give thanks. Not for the problem, not for what you're going through, but give thanks in that situation. In that moment, the Bible says, give thanks to the Lord. But how can I give thanks, Pastor? There's nothing in my life to give thanks. Yes, there is. There are a thousand reasons to give thanks every day. There are a million reasons to praise God every day. You are just looking at the wrong things. You're looking at yourself. You're looking at your problems. You're looking at the darkness and your vision has been blurred. You have been blinded. And you're thinking that there's nothing good in my family. There's nothing good in my circumstance. That's the lie of the devil. In everything, give thanks. You have to do it intentionally. You have to find in your own life things to thank God for in the midst of your darkness. You have to look away from your problems and look to God intentionally. Amen. The Bible says, rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Rejoice that if you believe in Jesus, you are born again. That is enough reason to praise God every day. It's enough reason to shout and praise and dance every day. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15. Therefore by Christ let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. Our praise and our thanksgiving is a sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus is our sacrifice. We don't have to sacrifice any more bulls and goats or our own penance for our sins. Jesus is our sacrifice. So every time we praise Jesus, we thank God from our hearts by Him, by Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the blood. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, hallelujah, for the resurrection of Christ. When we are praising and thanking God through Christ, that is our sacrifice in the New Testament and when it comes from a heart of humility, a contrite heart, a broken heart to the Lord, even when you don't want to praise Him because the Bible says it's a sacrifice which means even in difficult times, in sad times, in hurt times, in the hardening of your heart, in the melancholy of your heart, you realize that you don't have to carry that heart and by faith even though you don't want to do it, even though there is no joy in your heart by faith you're going to praise God and as you're praising God it's a sacrifice God receives it we enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise that is our sacrifice when we enter into God's presence with praise and thanksgiving and we lift up our heart to the Lord with praises and thanksgiving out of our lips the presence of God comes upon you the presence of God comes in your heart the breakthrough of God comes in your heart his deliverance comes in your heart his love fills your heart and it sets free your heart from that brokenness, from that hurt. So how do I heal my heart? Yes, we come to church and receive prayer. We open up a heart in counseling. And according to the Word of God, what I've seen is that your life of praise and thanksgiving is where your deepest healing and breakthrough will come in your heart. So let me give you seven benefits right now. Number one, when you praise and give thanks to God, you are putting on an armor all around you. We know that we have an enemy. His name is Satan. And he's constantly attacking Christians so that they lose their joy, their faith, they lose their testimony, and they lose their destiny before the Lord. So the Bible is encouraging us that you must take on the armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil in the evil day. That means it's not every day of your life, but it is a season. There are times that we are under attack. Now that can also be in your heart 
when you're always being assailed by fear and depression and sadness. So the Bible is saying, in that moment, put on the armor of God. The question is, how do I put on the armor of God? It's not the physical armor. I mean, if it's a camouflage uniform, it's very simple. I can go to the market, buy some camouflage, and look really like a warrior. But you can be dressed in a Roman soldier's uniform, you can be dressed in a Navy SEAL uniform, and the enemy can still get you because the attacks of the enemy are from the spirit. It's not physical. It's in the heart. It's directed to your heart and mind. So, if you look at the pieces of the armor that Paul mentions, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, helmet of salvation, all of that are referring to Bible truths. All of that is referring to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. The truth of who Jesus Christ is. The truth of redemption. That by His blood we are made righteous. So the righteousness covers your heart from guilt and shame and condemnation. The peace that we get because we believe we are forgiven of our sins. The truths of salvation which we meditate in our mind. That we are saved, we are delivered, we are redeemed from every curse of the law. We are made righteous, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Amen. So all of these truths, the Bible says, put it on. The question is, how do we put on spiritual truths? It's very simple. It's very easy. You put it on by meditation. You put it on by speaking it. How do I put on the armor of God? Very simple. When I praise and thank God for what He has done for me, Father, I thank You that you have forgiven me of all my sins. Father, I thank you. My name is written in the book of life. Father, I thank you that you have made me righteous by the blood of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you love me today. You have saved me from the powers of darkness. Father, I thank you that Satan is under my feet. Father, I thank you that you never leave me. Father, I thank you, Lord God, you have given me peace. I'm justified by my faith in God. Father, I thank you and I praise you. What are you doing? You are becoming conscious of these truths. And what you are doing is that you're putting on the armor of God. But not only you putting it on in your consciousness, because when you're praising and thanking God, God is raising up a shield of His presence over you and is protecting you from the attack of the enemy. So the first benefit is this. You are putting on the armor of God. You are putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, just by giving thanks and praise to God. The second benefit is this. It brings strength. It brings strength into your heart, into your life. Psalms 8 verse 2. Psalms 8 verse 2. The Bible says here, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. How does God silence the enemy and the avenger? The enemy comes every day to you to accuse you, to bring fear in your life, to tell you you will die quickly. Those thoughts come. What will I eat? What will I drink? I may die early because my father died early. So all those thoughts come. Those thoughts are from the enemy. Thoughts of guilt, condemnation comes. So the Bible says, out of the mouth of babes and infants, you will ordain strength. How does God do that? Jesus qualifies it, explains it in Matthew chapter 21, verse 16. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. So Jesus here is quoting Psalms 8, verse 2. But when Jesus is quoting this verse, instead of using strength, He's using the word praise because they are connected. How is it connected? Your praise is connected to your strength. Or in other words, your strength is connected to your praise. Praise produces strength. If you are lacking strength in your heart, you are lacking in praise. If you are lacking in strength in your heart, you are lacking in praise. When you praise God, your spiritual life becomes stronger. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, He has ordained strength. But Jesus said in the New Testament, it is when you're praising God, no matter how immature you think you are, no matter how spiritually young you may be, even though you may be a babe in Christ, when you begin to praise God out of your mouth, strength comes into your life. That means even the most feeble, thank you Lord, is bringing strength into you. There was a lady who was sick with stomach cancer, about to die, fourth stage, in the hospital, ICU, cannot take anything as weak as anything. I mean, cannot even talk because her energy is so low, can only whisper. So a man of God, known to me, he goes into that ICU, begins to whisper in her ear and says, you're going to die if you don't 
by your faith fight this I want you to whisper after me and so she said okay I'll whisper after you and the man whispered into her ear and said say this the Lord is the strength of my life the Lord is the strength of my life so she began to say the Lord is the strength of my life say it again the Lord is the strength of my life and encourage her to keep on saying it that even though you may be whispering it, you are praising Him, you are thanking Him for who He is in your life. So He worked with her for an hour, and by the time He left, she was, the Lord is the strength of my life. She was shouting in the ICU, the Lord is the strength of my life. Because as she began to whisper, strength came into her heart, strength came into her mind, and strength came into her body. In a few weeks' time, she was out of that hospital, cancer-free. The Lord will bring strength in your life, in your mind, in your heart, in your body if you will learn to take His Word and begin to praise Him. What is praise? Praise is a response to Him. What is His response to us? His response to us was the cross. It was grace. It was salvation. He loved us already. He has redeemed us already. He has healed us already. He has already delivered us through the sacrifice of Jesus. So, God is not going to do anything more for you. He's already done it. He has already blessed you in Christ. The fourth benefit, before I come back to the third one, the fourth benefit here in my list is this. It releases trust. Praise and thanksgiving releases trust to the Lord. So when I say, Father, I thank you. I am blessed. Your word says, Ephesians 1, 3, I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And I believe I'm blessed even though my money and my bank account and my life doesn't look blessed. I believe I'm blessed because you said it. I trust in you. I trust your word. And I keep on saying, I am blessed. Father, I thank you. I am blessed. Father, I thank you. I am blessed. I'm not trying to convince myself. I'm already convinced. And I'm declaring my faith in Him, through my praise and my thanksgiving. Do you know what that is? That is called trust. But we don't do that. We like to complain and grumble about how life is. We like to be sad all the time, complaining, grumbling, negativity. Do you know what that is? That is trusting in the devil. That is trusting in the power of darkness. That's why our response to His word is our trust. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 3, 17 to 19. I want you to look at this. Though the fig tree may not blossom, no fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fall and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Look at the next verse, verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will. It's your choice from your heart and your mind, your intentional decision to rejoice. Rejoice means find joy in God. And the word re means do it again. So joy in the Lord and re means do it again and again and again and again. So thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Lord, I bless you for you have blessed me for every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Hallelujah. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I thank you. Do it as long as it is necessary for your heart to change, for peace and joy to flood back in your heart. Look at the next verse, verse 19. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and He will make me walk on my high heels. How does that come? How does the Lord become your strength? And how do you gain feet like deer's feet so that you may walk on the high hills, the hills of poverty, the hills of depression? You can run and overcome. How? 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 If you will rejoice in the Lord no matter what you're going through. Joy brings the strength of the Lord in your life. Rejoice in the Lord. How many of you believe in Jesus? Can I see your hands? Do you know that joy is already there? It's already there. You may not be feeling joy. Some of you may be depressed. But let me tell you this. Joy is already in you because the kingdom of God is already in you. The Holy Spirit is already in you. Joy is there. How many of you sometimes when you go to the shop and you ask for some kind of drink, the sugar is at the bottom? And they haven't mixed it well so when they bring it to you and you take the first sip there's no sugar so they tell you stir it the sugar is in the bottom so if you stir that sugar and keep on stirring it the sugar fills the entire drink and now when you drink it it's the right sweetness for you that's what joy is already inside you now what you need to do is open your mouth and by faith when you're feeling down 
praise God, thank Him. What are you doing? You are stirring the joy inside you. When you're praising God and thanking Him, you're stirring up the joy. And that joy is beginning to flood every area of your life. And it's bringing strength to your body. It's bringing freshness to your mind. And the joy of the Lord becomes my strength. The third benefit is this. It brings deliverance. Praise and thanksgiving brings deliverance. Paul and Silas were in prison. They praised and thanked God. And the power of God came to the prison, set them free. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat was faced with the army of three kings coming against Israel. He begins to cry out to the Lord. And the God says, send ahead of the army the musicians and let them sing. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. So as the musicians began to praise and worship the Lord, when the enemy was coming against them, the Bible says the Lord sent ambushments against the army of those three kings, destroyed them completely. And not only that, all the loot and all the blessing they were able to collect for three days after that. Praise and worship and thanksgiving will bring deliverance in your life. Can you say amen? Point number five, praise and thanksgiving will bring light and wisdom of God in your life. Psalm 73, 16 to 17. Here David's heart is filled with confusion, filled with questions. And one of his questions was this, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Why is it that the wicked seem to have strength the houses seem to increase. They seem to get richer and richer. And those who love the Lord and those who are humble and they're righteous, their family and their children, they're not prospering. And his heart was filled with questions. So you know what he does? He goes into the presence of God. Verse 16. When I thought how to understand this, even today, this fills a heart with so many questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? That's again a question that we have. But you must understand all from the lens of grace. God is gracious. God gives time for everyone to turn to Him. Amen. So what David does is he goes into the presence of God. How do we go into the presence of God? Praise and thanksgiving. And he says, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. That means his heart was pained. Just like all of us, our heart is pained with the things we see in our own lives, our family, in society. It was too painful for me, verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, the presence of God, then I understood. When you come into the presence of God with a heavy heart, the Lord will bring light, understanding, and you will understand. In other words, you will have a vision. A vision means you will see God's perspective. You will see from God's viewpoint. And that question and that pain in your heart, the Lord will remove. In other words, the presence of God brings perspective. Psalms 34, if you will turn there, verse 1 to 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Magnify the Lord. It means make the Lord bigger in your life. Now, we cannot make God bigger. He's already big. But in our perspective, He may be small because our problems may be bigger. The sadness of our heart may seem bigger to us. So when we begin to praise and give Him thanks and bless Him, what's happening is that in our perspective, in our vision, God's true nature is established. God's true ability is established. And the problems which we seemed were mountains actually become molehills. And we begin to realize, wait a minute, God can take care of this. If you could feed 5,000 in the wilderness, why won't He provide for my rent this month? That's nothing to God. For God to heal you of your sickness is nothing. But because we have faced it constantly, chronically in our life, we think that it's a huge deal. Whereas for God, it's nothing. But when we lift up our heart in praise and thanksgiving to God, the true picture of God is established in our hearts and our faith is responding that God is almighty. He can do all things. All things are possible to those who believe. And as you walk by faith, God takes care of those situations in your life. The next benefit is this. Matthew chapter 1 verse 3. It births blessings. The Bible says here, Judah begot Perez. The word Judah in Hebrew means praise. Can everyone say praise? Praise. Judah means praise. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Jesus will come to you through your praise. I hope you got that as a rhema word for some of you today. You're asking Jesus to come into your life. He will come to you, he says, 
through your praise. When you praise him, he will come. Judah begot Perez. The word Perez means breaking through, breaking forth. It's a picture of a mountain stream that breaks forth out of the rocks. It's the picture of God bringing forth water out of the rock. That's what Perez means. So, praise begot Perez. Praise begets blessings. When we praise God, when we praise God, when we praise God, there is a breaking forth in our lives. There's a breaking out in our lives. The blessings are birthed to praise. So after we have believed, after we have prayed, what more do we need to add into our heart, our daily life continually? It's called praise and thanksgiving. David praised God seven times a day. He thanked God seven times a day. He says, you need to bring it as a continuous habitual discipline into your life. The last blessing is this. Ephesians 5, 18 to 20. You'll be full of the Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. How? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Verse 20. Giving thanks always. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we give thanks, He fills us with His Spirit. When we give thanks, He fills us with His Spirit. When we offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, the fire of His Spirit comes upon our lives. And let me tell you, it's not just for you. It begins to affect your body. It begins to affect your circumstance, your family, your finances, every area of your life, your job. When you begin to praise God, even in the place of your work, I tell you this, you will attract the favor of your boss. As a businessman, you have a shop, come early, spend 30 minutes praising and thanking God. Bring the presence of God through your sacrifice of praise and you will attract more customers to your shop. But don't do it only because of greed. Do it because you want to honor God. But the guarantee is there. It will begin to affect your business. Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. Did you know that the Bible says that blessed are those who not only hear the word, but actually do the word. There is more blessing in practicing the word than only hearing it. And I want to encourage you therefore to practice this word immediately. Would you also kindly comment in the comment section how you were blessed through this message? And if you have any prayer requests, feel free to text or call the numbers that are given and there are people here that are willing to pray for you for God's blessing upon your life. And again, please like, subscribe, and share this video, and you'll be doing your part in sharing this message to the world. God bless you.